Rosa, who was a uh, disc jockey on WNEW, who was fired by Arthur Gottfried on the talent scouts in the 1950s. Nicest guy uh, that I ever met in the business. Um, presidents in politics and sports. I've been involved in the politics of sports business probably since 1981 with the uh, Major League Baseball uh, strike, uh, the player strike. And uh, over the years, because of sports, I ended up uh, dealing with Richard Nixon. Uh, I ended up uh, dealing with Bill Clinton. I ended up dealing with Donald Trump, with the USFL initially and boxing and some other things. Hey, Evan. Hey, Kent, how are you? And um, I uh, also spoke at the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library. It was a State Department job talking about the politics of sports business to 16 foreign nationals and four Americans. So I've been around this a little bit. Um, Baseball. Baseball. During the Civil War, baseball was played by the North and the South in between battles, uh, the soldiers from both sides. Uh, Andrew Johnson takes over as president of the United States following the assassination of Abe Lincoln. And uh, he's playing around, talking to his advisors, trying to figure out, well, I got the South, I got the North, where we have to unify the country. Congress is, wants to unify the country. There are people in the South that want to get back together with people in the North. We have to find the commonality. We need a commonality. And he's talking to his advisors. And there is a baseball team in Washington, D.C., the Nationals. And um, one of his advisors is close to the people who run the Washington Nationals baseball team. And baseball in the 1860s doesn't resemble baseball in the 2020s. Totally different game. But uh, Johnson and his advisors start talking about What's something that both sides have in common? And they said, baseball, baseball. Yeah. Now, what can we do with that? Well, hey, why don't we invite players to the White House showing some public unity and some spirit? So Andrew Johnson meets with members of the Washington Nationals baseball team and the Brooklyn Atlantics uh, baseball players at the White House. This is August uh, 30th, 1865. And it's the first known official meeting between the president of the United States and an organized baseball team at the executive mansion. And it's said that Johnson liked baseball. Uh, and uh, he saw this as an opportunity to unite the country, or as the states were coming back into the union, national unity through baseball. Um, and baseball is picking up around the country again. And uh, in 1868, there's a presidential election. Ulysses S. Grant, who was uh, the uh, Union Army leader, is against uh, Horatio Seymour. They're the candidates for the president's presidency. And according to a book called uh, Baseball in Blue and Gray by George Kirsch, teams of Grant supporters in Seymour supporters once played a baseball game against each other. They found that commonality. Uh, Grant would win, and Grant would invite a baseball team, again, show of national unity, to the White House, the Cincinnati Red Stockings, uh, the first professional baseball team, at least in theory, because all of their players were taking money from an owner as opposed to taking money under the table. 1868, Lippy Pike. Lippin Pike was the only paid player. He played with Philadelphia. Everybody else was taking money under the table. I don't know why it was looked down upon, but anyway, so Cincinnati has an all professional team. And on June 26th, 1869, Grant brings them to the White House. Except it wasn't called the White House then. It's called the President's Mansion for a visit. Uh, and Cincinnati Red Stockings players were all paid ballplayers. Uh, Grant also did one other thing. When he had some time, uh, there was a baseball field behind the White House in Washington. Remember, Washington was just a little backwater city until World War II. And there was a baseball field. And boys used to play baseball on a field behind the White House. And according to some, uh, it is said that Grant would sometimes join them and play baseball with them. It's pretty cool. President of the United States playing with a bunch of eight-year-olds baseball. Uh, really nothing we know of with Rutherford B. Hayes. We do know one thing about Grant. He finally did see a baseball game in New York in the 1880s. Grover Cleveland, uh, the 22nd and 24th president of the United States, really didn't have much use for sports, but he would meet 
with members of the Chicago Baseball Club um, in during his first term. Uh, here is a depiction of him shaking hands with Cap Anson, who is the uh, captain of the Chicago White Stockings. But uh, Grant, uh, rather, Cleveland didn't have much use for sports. He said, what do you imagine? What do you imagine the American people would think of me if I wasted my time going to the ball game? He never went to a baseball game. Um, Harrison was around, McKinley was around. They really didn't do very much with sports, but this guy did, Theodore Roosevelt. And Theodore Roosevelt is the guy who in some areas of the college football industry is thought to have saved college football and pro football from extinction in 1905. Um, lots of problems with uh, the game of football because there were deaths on the field. Um, Roosevelt threatened to ban football in America unless the rules were implemented to make the game safer. There were reported 40 players, 22 of them in 1904, 18 of them in 1905, who died from injuries suffered on the field over that, um, actually it's far less than two year periods from September 1904 through November 1905. And um, we don't know how many of the coal miners, I have a book called The Coal Miners Game about uh, how the NFL became the NFL, uh, out of the coal mines in Western Pennsylvania and West Virginia and, and some over in Ohio. Um, but anyway, um, Roosevelt is under pressure from a lot of people to do something about football because you have all these college players dying and we don't know how many uh, civilians are dying or getting maimed while playing football because of the rules of those days. Uh, but nobody could actually figure out how Roosevelt was going to end this game. Uh, he couldn't end the game. If you think of it rationally, he couldn't end, end it. I mean, but maybe, maybe if he threatens to ban the game, he'll get enough changes in, in the playing rules to make the game safer. The Roosevelt Initiative in 1905 would eventually lead to the formation of the NCAA. But how did we get there? Well, uh, Roosevelt brought the presidents of Harvard, Yale, and Princeton into the Oval Office, used the bully pulpit, took the three of them and said, hey, get this game fixed or else. There are a couple other compelling reasons here that Roosevelt did this, but he wanted to save the game, not kill the game. Why? Number one, he hated his alma mater, Harvard, he hated Harvard's president, Charles Elliott. And the Harvard contingent wanted to either change football or get rid of it. And then there was Walter Camp, who in 1876 wrote the rules of modern day football or modern day football in 1876. And he was the coach at Yale University and he wanted to keep it as is. And Princeton was brought in. They were on the fence with both Harvard and Yale. But uh, things like that cartoon popped up in newspapers, the 12th player in every game. And on that football, I don't know if you can see it all that well, it says uh, killer on it. It's a guy, a skeleton wrapped in, in, a, in, a, in a shawl. Uh, and uh, on his, the field behind them are the bodies littering the field of dead football players. So this is becoming an issue. Uh, in the Roosevelt uh, White House. What do we do with the fact that there's a high rate of mortality on the football field? Take a look at that football too. Football is a little different, shaped like a watermelon, not shaped like it is today. I demand that football changes its rules or be abolished, change the game or forsake it. But, but, but Roosevelt hated Elliott. His son, Theodore Roosevelt Jr., even though he suffered major injuries from football in high school and college, loved the game. And if you can remember the, the, the story about Theodore Roosevelt, he's this rugged outdoorsman. Uh, he thinks it's manly to do outdoor things and it's manly to play football. So he's got Elliot, he's got his son, and he's got one other thing going for him that he doesn't want to abolish football. He has a soft spot for the game. See, he is the assistant secretary of the Navy back under McKinley in 1898. And um, he decides he's gonna go see what is really going on with the Spanish-American War down in Puerto Rico, down in Cuba. And he goes up San Juan Hill with the Rough Riders. 
Uh, and he looked at the occupations of the guys who signed up for the Rough Riders, and 10 of them listed their occupations as pro football players when they enlisted in 1898. So that is the third thing that Roosevelt has uh, or that is going for football in Roosevelt's mind. Uh, so he has a soft spot. And as a result of that meeting, the American Football Rules Committee was formed. 1906, plays were opened up or plays were designed to open up the game and allegedly make it less dangerous to play. Um, I don't know how less dangerous it was uh, because 108 years later, there would be another White House summit about football and sports and concussions. But uh, this one uh, was designed to have less people die on the field. The committee passed legislation that led to the introduction of the forward pass uh, previously, and it also changed the size of the football to where it is today. Previously, the only way you could move the ball if you were throwing it is laterally and you moved ahead. They changed the first distance for, or the distance for first down from five yards to 10 yards, which means you didn't pick up players and try to throw them for that extra yard. Uh, more importantly, all mass formations and gang tackling were banned. And with that, everybody thought the game of football would be much safer. Of course, a century later, those issues were being taken up again. Uh, William Howard Taft didn't do anything in terms of official doing something about sports, but he came up with a, a couple of ideas that have stuck in baseball since 1910. And they all had to do with uh, the suffragettes, uh, women who were looking for the right to vote. And it's April 14th, 1910. And uh, it's the uh, opening day of the baseball season in Washington, DC. And William Howard Taft is stuck in his office and he is meeting with a lot of women and a lot of women trying to convince him that he should be championing their right to vote. Taft says, no, no, no. And they wanna know why, why, why? No, 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 just no, no, no. So this meeting, and, and they didn't even have the real, the real strident women like Alice Paul, who was gonna starve herself to death um, to gain the right to vote. That's, that's how some of the women were looking for the right to vote. And Alice Paul actually wrote the first Equal Rights Amendment and was around in 1972. She did that about 1922, 72, that uh, the Equal Rights Amendment went before voters. But anyway, Taft is uh, meeting with these women and he is getting increasingly upset. And he ends up going to opening day in Washington, D.C. and throwing out the first pitch of the Major League Baseball season. He just had a really bad day at the office and he was looking to get out. He couldn't stay there, but the women were there and they weren't leaving. So he passes a note to one of his staffers saying, get me out of here, see if we can get tickets to the baseball game. Uh, the staffer contacts the Nationals. The Nationals quickly assemble a presidential little place uh, next to the field where uh, Taft could sit with his entourage because uh, he told the, uh, the staffer, hey, I, I need something to lift my spirits and the and, and spirits of the staff. Go do what you can do. Well, the staffer comes back, hands him a note, says, we're going to the ball game. Take me out to the ball game, Taft said. And his staffer said, we're going. Um, and there is uh, William Howard Taft. And uh, that is the first time ever a president threw out a first ball on opening day. Now, just take a look at that crowd for a minute and count the women there. Very few women are in there. It was not thought of for women as a proper place to ever go to a baseball game. And uh, it's, this, it's two years after that the baseball anthem, Take Me Out to the Ball Game, was written by uh, uh, Albert von Tilzer. He did the music and Jack Norwith, who did the music. And Norwith, before he married Norma Bays, actually dated a suffragette. And probably that song is based on the girlfriend. Um, and I don't know if she ever said, take me out to the ball game or not. But if you listen to Take Me Out to the Ball Game, it's a woman who's singing to the man, take me out to the ball game, take me out to the crowd. Highly unusual, but fits in with the suffragette world. 
As you can see, very few women are there. The other thing that Taft started that day was the seventh inning stretch. Now, baseball games back in those days um, were quick, an hour and a half, and that was that. No television commercials, no preening at the batter's box, no looking in for the sign for a half hour or whatever, no constant throwing the first base. Yeah, all that other stuff that goes on in baseball. Uh, here we get to the uh, middle of the seventh inning, and those seats were only 19 inches. They were not 23 inches, which is the standard size of arena and stadium seats today. They were 19 inches, and Taft is a big man, probably the biggest man who ever served as president. He once got stuck in the White House bathtub, and so he's beginning to squirm because he's there, and it's the seventh inning, and and there may have been a tradition in Ohio in the 1890s where people got up just to stretch out after a while, and it happened in the seventh inning. And um, top of the seventh inning is done, and he's squirming, and he stands up. And everybody who is at the stadium that day looks around, hey, the president stood up. We better stand up. And he's stretching a little bit, and they're stretching a little bit because they're seeing the president. And they think that the president's about ready to leave, so they're also giving him a sign of respect. And um, he sits down, watches the rest of the game. They sit down, watch the rest of the game. And with that, the story goes, the seventh inning stretch is invented by William Howard Taft, April 14th, 1910 in Washington. Although there is some evidence that back in Ohio from where uh, Taft uh, lived, um, people stood up some point in the game to stretch out. And the other thing, uh, as you can see, there are very few women there, so he was able to run away and uh, enjoy himself uh, without worrying about suffragettes. Uh, people watched him. Woodrow Wilson in World War II. Uh, this is rather interesting because Woodrow Wilson kind of used baseball as a propaganda tool as, for support for World War I. Uh, the Army General Enoch, uh, Enoch Crowder convinced Newton Baker, who was the U.S. Secretary of War at the time, 1917, that any draft-eligible men employed in non-essential jobs should be forced to choose, enlist to help stateside, or risk going to the front lines of Europe. Baseball was considered a non-essential job. In fact, in 1918, uh, the season was shortened because of the war. And uh, the American League owner said, let's get out of here September 1st. The National League owner said, no, let's continue through the end of the season. Then we'll play the World Series. Uh, the American League owners weren't that interested in the World Series. But it's a good thing that, uh, at least for the Boston Red Sox in the American League, that they played the World Series because behind the pitching of Babe Ruth, through all those shutout innings, it's a guy who won 88 games as a pitcher before he hit all those home runs. Uh, the Red Sox uh, would be baseball's world champion in 1918. But before I jump too far ahead, 1918, uh, many players prior to that enlisted in the war effort. The Boston Braves catcher Hank Gowdy was the first to enlist. As I said, the American League owners did not want to play the 1918 World Series. The National League owners did. Wilson, by this time, has a propaganda arm to support the war. This is one of the posters that was used, get into the game, support the troops with Uncle Sam playing baseball. There's something else that went on too during this. Uh, the Committee on Public Information was created by Woodrow Wilson. Uh, the national anthem, which was not the national anthem in 1918, becomes prominent at sports events thanks to the Committee on Public Information. Um, the then Star Spangled Banner was played at Fenway Park during the 1918 World Series. Uh, the Star Spangled Banner initially in the 1890s was performed at, mil at Army bases, Navy and Army installations. It was played when flags were lowered at the end of the day. But starting in 1897, at the opening day in Philadelphia for the baseball team there, um, the uh, national, it wasn't the national anthem, Star Spangled Banner was played. And then in 1898, uh, at uh, New York Giants games, uh, at the Polo Grounds uh, in Upper Manhattan. So uh, the song has some baseball history. 
Game one, Fenway Park, 1918 World Series. Remember the seventh inning stretch invented by Taft about eight years earlier. There's a military band there. And the military band's been playing. And they have some seats. And uh, all of a sudden, there's an impromptu rendition of the Star Spangled Banner. It would be played at every Red Sox World Series game. And then sporadically, starting in 1919 at other cities in other cities other stadiums oddly enough the cubs are in the world series here and uh, it wasn't played at wrigley field and it would be phil wrigley's cubs that would be the last team to play the national anthem and it was the national anthem by the time chicago played it it becomes the national anthem in 1931 our uh, herbert hoover now herbert hoover really didn't do all that much in connection with sports uh, but there's a great story of Herbert Hoover and uh, Babe Ruth. 1932, Babe Ruth. Uh, there's the Babe. The babe is holding out. He wants $80,000 a year from the New York Yankees. And there's this big, uh, in those days, it was press conferences because it was basically all newspapers. It might have been a radio station doing it live or whatever. And he's holding a news conference. And uh, he says, I want $80,000 a year. Or I'm going to hold out. I think I'm worth $80,000 a year. And uh, there's some leather lung guy in the New York press corps. And I got into the New York press corps in the late 1970s. And I've heard this story too, from people who were there actually. And some one guy says, hey babe, hey babe, you know, uh, $80,000 a year, that's more than Hoover's making. And babe's answer, what the hell has Hoover got to do with this? Anyway, I had a better year than he did. Herbert Hoover did one thing. And uh, this was not a good thing for sports owners. In fact, the National Football League was down to about eight teams by then. In fact, Chicago Bears almost went out of business and around this time. And it was Curly Lambeau with the Green Bay Packers who loaned uh, George Hallis about $1,500 to meet a payroll to keep the Bears going roughly at this time. If you ever, and I know this is an Illinois crowd and I shouldn't say that, but if you ever go to a, the Green Bay Packers Museum uh, in Green Bay, next to Lambeau Field, uh, you will see this IOU from George Hallis to Curly Lambeau, IOU X amount of dollars, uh, so George Hallis could meet the payroll. Uh, Hoover decided, well, there is a way to raise money for the United States government in the fight against the Depression. Let's put a tax on, an amusement tax on, and we'll charge sports, we'll charge movies, we'll charge Broadway, will charge vaudeville and any other entertainment form. Well, vaudeville was dying out by then. Uh, this tax actually hurt all of sports because attendance went down more so than it normally would because there was this added charge uh, from the Herbert Hoover amusement tax. Uh, three and a half years ago, uh, I was up at uh, Franklin Roosevelt's uh, Presidential Museum, which is a gorgeous place if you're ever in the New York area. It's about 85 miles north of New York City, uh, right on the Hudson River. It's got this great view of the Hudson and all. And uh, so I went to go visit uh, FDR because uh, there are a few things I want to talk to him about. Uh, I do a talk about the 1936 Berlin Olympics, and uh, I wanted to know from Roosevelt why he said, yeah, let's send the team to Berlin because I wanted to know whether or not that legitimized the Hitler Nazi regime. Um, and I want to find out what he thought about it. Uh, I also do a talk on the early days of TV. Roosevelt, the radio communicator, was the first guy on television in the United States uh, on April 30th, 1939, from the World's Fair in New York City. And I also wanted to find out about what was called the Green Light Letter uh, after uh, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor on uh, December 7th, 1941. Um, and uh, I got to say, Franklin and Eleanor were very nice hosts, uh, very gracious hosts. Uh, they smiled as we took the picture. They were a little stiff, but, you know, that's, that's to be expected. And, you know, they offered us books, but it was hard to turn the page. But they were very nice, very nice. And I did get my answers to 1936, 1939, and 1942. Uh, let's talk about 1936 briefly. Uh, in 1935, the former Assistant Secretary of the United States Navy, Ernest Lee Jackney, and Jeremiah Mahoney pushed for an American boycott of the 1936 Berlin Summer Games. Uh, Jackney, uh, who was of German descent, uh, sent a letter 
to the International Olympic Committee President Count Henri Belay Latour, uh, saying that he was outraged by what he was hearing from within Germany. That letter goes out on November 25th, 1935. And uh, it was the first time that uh, there was talk about boycotting the 1936 Summer Olympics. Now, the Winter Olympics were also held in Munich that year. It wasn't much of a problem with Munich, but Berlin becomes a problem. Uh, Judge Jeremiah Mahoney, oh, by the way, uh, Jackney never got an answer for, from Latour or the IOC. Uh, and he would quit, which meant open the door for Avery Brundage another story for another talk about the Olympics. Uh, Judge Jeremiah Mahoney recommended on December 8th, 1935, that the Americans drop out of the Berlin Games. And he would go across the country. Sometimes Janky would be with him. Sometimes Al Smith would be with him. Sometimes James Curley would be with him, uh, the governor of New York Smith and Curley, the governor of Massachusetts. And they were Catholics saying, we cannot go to the Olympics. But uh, Roosevelt saw no problem in going to the Olympics uh, and didn't say anything about it other than I urged the Olympic, the Olympians to go. And I knew Marty Glickman. I knew Sam Stoller. I worked with Marty Glickman in the 1980s. I knew Sam from uh, the Milrose game, track and field. And uh, Marty said he made, he, FDR, made the right decision, Marty being Jewish. Uh, and I wanted to go to Berlin, win a medal, and stick it in the Fuhrer's face. Uh, unfortunately, neither Marty nor Sam were able to run the relay race. They were replaced by Ralph Midcalf and Jesse Owens because Avery Brundage did not want the Fuhrer to see two Jews on the podium winning the gold medal, and they were bounced from the Olympics. Um, the, Berlin Olympic, Berlin, the Berlin Olympics was politically charged, but Roosevelt said to the American team, go, even though he knew full well about the strangulation of Jewish rights and other people's rights in Germany. So there was no boycott. There's Marty on the left, Sam on the right, and uh, they never ran. Meanwhile, a couple of years later, five years later, Pearl Harbor, and uh, actually it's six years later. His was December 8th, 1935, this December 7th, 1941, uh, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And um, Kennesaw Mountain landed. He is the commissioner of Major League Baseball, uh, sends Franklin Roosevelt a letter saying, what are we supposed to do? I mean, look, in 1918, we cut the season short. We almost didn't have a, a World Series. What do you think we should do? Now, um, I knew the answer before I went up to uh, see Roosevelt because Dan Rooney, the president of the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers, one of their owners, about 25 years ago, he and I talked about uh, the green light letter. And, um, well, let me get into the green light letter and then I'll tell you about uh, Rooney. Uh, this was the answer to Kennesaw Mountain Landis. There will be fewer people unemployed and everybody will work longer hours and harder than ever before. And that means they ought to have a chance for recreation and for taking their minds off their work even more than before. Play ball. Uh, Dan Rooney told me, and he was a kid, maybe 10, 12 years old at the time with the Pittsburgh Steelers, that when we saw that letter in the NFL, that gave us the green light to play. Uh, and I bring Rooney up only because of the Chicago area. In 1944, there were no Navy bases around Pittsburgh. There were no Army bases around Pittsburgh. And the only way NFL teams fielded a full, a full team was from players who were station near the stadiums where they could play football. Uh, Rooney's team in 1943 combined with the Philadelphia Eagles. They became the Steagles for one year. That didn't work out. And then 1944, because of all of the Navy activity on Lake Michigan, uh, they combined with the Chicago Cardinals, uh, now the Arizona Cardinals, and fielded a team. That really didn't work out well. Had the war continued, uh, through 1945, uh, the Brooklyn Dodgers that had a uh, NFL team at that time would have combined with Pittsburgh. But Rooney said, we took that green light letter to mean we could play as well. Eisenhower. Uh, Eisenhower was president between 1953 and 1961. And uh, Eisenhower thought that uh, maybe, just maybe, if we did some cultural exchange uh, with the Soviet Union and Nikita Khrushchev, Maybe we could find some opening and, and get a thaw in the Cold War. 
And uh, I was at uh, Rockefeller Center in uh, 1995. And that was the 35th anniversary of the United States defeating Czechoslovakia to win the gold medal at Squaw Valley in Lake Tahoe in California. And the 15th anniversary of the American Olympic team beating the Finns to win the gold medal in the 1980 Lake Placid Olympics. Uh, and uh, there was a guy by the name of Bill Cleary, who was on the United States national hockey team, who told me some stories. So Eisenhower is looking for something, and he decides to send the United States national hockey team uh, to play some exhibition games against the Soviets in Moscow. He also allowed the Boston Bruins and the uh, New York Rangers to miss the playoffs uh, around the same time, 1958 to go to Moscow and play some uh, pre of oh, some exhibition games after the season. Uh, so this guy, his name is Bill Cleary. He was on the 1956 and 1960 uh, United States national hockey team. And uh, I had my son with me, we're going to, I, I told him to cut school. He was 10 years old at the time, nine years old at the time. I said, I'm taking you. He said, where are we going? I said, we're going to Rockefeller Plaza to the skating rink. I said, bring your skates and we're gonna meet some people. Uh, which we did, and I had to sign the note the next day. My son went to a more educational opportunity than being in fourth grade today. Signed, me. Anyway, so Cleary said, did you ever hear about our trip to Moscow? I said, no. What happened? He said, oh, he says, you sure you never heard this? I said, no, I never did. So tell me. And so he starts telling me the story. He says, yeah, we, we get together. We're all up in Massachusetts. You know, we're firemen. We're students. We only had one professional hockey player at the time, Tom Williams who ended up in the National Hockey League about a couple of years later. And he says, so we all get together and they think, well, we'll go play some hockey in Moscow and we're going to go there and, and we're going we're gonna to be cultural exchange um, players. And uh, track and field uh, team also went over there. And he said, so, you know, we're going to spread some goodwill from America over to the Soviet Union and hopefully get some reciprocation. Now, the reciprocation that Khrushchev sent was uh, the dancing bears from the Moscow Circus. The Moscow Circus came. I love the Moscow Circus. I used to watch him on Ed Sullivan, the Ed Sullivan Show. He used to have the dancing bears, uh, and also uh, the boy show, the uh, Bolshoi Ballet. Yeah, you know, that was not for me watching the Sullivan Show, but the bears were because I was at the proper age to wear the bears. So the cultural exchange takes place. So Cleary says we get to Moscow. And he says, you know, we get to the to the hotel in Moscow. I don't know if you've ever been in Russia, but there is neoclassical Soviet architecture. Everything is in gray, drab gray. Everything's in gray. If you ever go up to Ottawa and you want to go see the Russian embassy on Embassy Row, you can't miss it. It's in drab gray for whatever reason they love gray paint in the Soviet Union. So they get to the hotel and they go out to dine. So Cleary talks about eating in the Moscow restaurant with his teammates and what the Soviet intimidation tactic of the day was. Oh, before we get that, they go into their rooms and they go check uh, all the beds and the bedding and they check the curtains and all, looking to see if their microphones planted there so the Soviets could listen to their conversations. So they get into the, the ballroom and they see this big ballroom and all the tables are out and all the finest and silverware is out, and napkins and plates and all that other stuff. And um, so it's all there, the knives are there, forks there, glass there, spoons are there. And they sit down and they look into their soup bowl and they see models of the Sputnik spacecraft. They're there at every soup plate at every table. And Cleary says, well, clearly they wanted to intimidate us by telling us that the Sputnik spacecraft was the first spacecraft ever, artificial satellite ever in space, and we controlled space because we're there. Um, so that's the intimidation uh, tactic that was used. They uh, went up, played some uh, exhibition games, clearly so they had a good time in Soviet Union, and they went home. But no, it didn't lower the temperature on the Cold War. And there is Sputnik, a 100 pound, 180 pound beach ball like thing with spokes coming out of it and uh, filled with wiring and everything else. And that was supposed to give uh, the Soviets uh, superiority in the world because they were first into space. John Kennedy did a couple things. Uh, one has, well, actually, they both have a permanent impact on uh, 
on the National Football League and sports in general. He was assassinated uh, on November 22nd, 1963. Um, and he left one permanent impression on the sports world and one permanent impression on one sports team. He created a massive revenue stream for sports owners by signing the uh, Sports Broadcast Act of 1961 into law on September 30th of that year. He wasn't responsible for the legislation, but he could have vetoed it. A Brooklyn Democrat, uh, Congressman Emanuel Seller, who I believe started uh, in Congress prior to Illinois being a state. Uh, he must have been in Congress since the War of 1812. Seriously, he was in Congress since 1920. Uh, so he wrote the bill and that allowed the National Football League to take all 14 of its teams group them as one and sell it to the highest TV bidder, which gets around antitrust laws. Baseball had that because of the antitrust exemption the Supreme Court gave them in 1922. And the American Football League did it because nobody cared. It was a new startup football league and nobody noticed. Uh, but that changed, the, uh, that changed the landscape of everything for the NBA, NHL, MLS, uh, and the NFL, because all of a sudden Green Bay the Packers uh, board of directors had the same amount of money as the New York Giants owners. Uh, and they were able to use that money to, to sign Bart Starr. And the only one they didn't say was Jim Ringo, the center who went to Philadelphia. But every guy, everybody in Green Bay was paid because of the CBS TV money. Uh, the seller bill allowed the National Football League to market its broadcast rights as a league package that evenly spread broadcasting revenues among the 14 franchises and guaranteed each team substantial annual revenues. And there is Emanuel Seller. You thought I was joking that he was uh, in Congress during the War of 1812. He was an old, old guy. Uh, the act would also apply to the NBA, NHL, and uh, other sports, um, not Major League Baseball because they had the antitrust exemption. Take a good look at this guy. Look at him, look at you. That is George Preston Marshall. And George Preston Marshall was the owner of the Washington NFL team. And uh, George Preston Marshall was not hiring any Negroes for his team. Uh, Maury Povich's father, Shirley Povich, was the sports editor of the uh, Washington Post. Uh, here's an aside. Uh, somebody once asked uh, Shirley, well, what do you think of your son Maury show? You know, Maury, the Maury show, who's your daddy? Um, and Shirley lived to about 100 years old. Maury's 83 now. He's going to do that show for another 10 years. Anyway, uh, and uh, Shirley said, you know, I used to hate, I was embarrassed by the show until I saw Maury's paycheck. He showed me the paycheck. And I said, Maury, where do I get one of those shows? By the way, Maury's first job was the play-by-play uh, -play announcer for the Washington Senators in 1960. So 62 years later, he's still on TV. Uh, but anyway, George Preston Marshall, Shirley Povich sent him a letter or in actually is a letter as, as part of an editorial in the Washington Post. And he asked George Preston Marshall, when are you going to hire a Negro player? And George Preston Marshall's reply was, I'll hire a Negro player when the, Wash when the Harlem Globetrotters hire a white guy. He was going to keep his stance going. But uh, in 1962, the Kennedy administration was having no part of this anymore. After all, federal money was going into the building of DC Stadium. And because federal money went into the building of DC Stadium, that meant equal opportunity employment for everybody. Uh, Marshall has to meet with the Kennedy administration because they are basically saying, unless you adhere by EOE, uh, you're not going to get a lease to play there. And he wants to get out of Griffith Stadium because he can make more money in D.C. Stadium under the right set of circumstances with the lease. Uh, and so um, it, it would be the Udell, uh, Secretary of the Interior, Udell, telling him, and there you got uh, Udell with John F. Kennedy, uh, Stuart Udell, uh, saying, hey, look, um, you want to move here? Uh, we're fine with it, but you better start hiring Negro players. And uh, Marshall takes a look at the bottom line uh, and, and he looks, well, Major League Baseball is desegregated. The NBA is desegregated. Uh, even the National Hockey League is desegregated with Willie O'Ree playing in 1959 with the Boston Bruins prior to the Boston Red Sox hiring Pumpy, Pumpsy Green. 
So he's uh, stuck here. Um, he wants to make more money and he's got to listen to the Kennedy administration and they put a lot of pressure on him. Here's the ultimatum. You hire a Negro player or you find somewhere else to play. And uh, George Preston Marshall finally gives in and he drafts Ernie Davis, a running back from uh, Syracuse, Syracuse University. And then he trades Ernie Davis to the Cleveland Browns for Bobby Mitchell. Best thing that ever happened to Bobby Mitchell. I knew Bobby Mitchell. And uh, he, he went to Ohio State University. He was gonna be a dentist and football got in the way. And from the time he got to Washington in 1962 through the early 21st century, no party was, no A-list party was anything unless Bobby Mitchell was there, which I pointed out to him one day. And he said, I guess you were right. Uh, Marshall got his 30 year lease with the federal government, picked Ernie Davis to shut up JFK and Udell. And then he sends Davis for Mitchell and the first round pick after the uh, 1962 draft. Uh, unfortunately, Ernie Davis had leukemia, never played it down in the National Football League and passed away before the 1963 season. Uh, John Kennedy did bring players to the White House, and it, it is probably the first team meeting since Ulysses S. Grant uh, brought the Cincinnati Red Stockings in 1869 to the White House. These are the Boston Celtics. Bill Russell is not there, by the way. Uh, this was probably arranged by Arnold Red Arbeck uh, because he had friends at the State Department. He was living in Washington. And uh, actually, he had so many friends at the State Department, and he was mad that the Soviets kept beating the American college kids. Uh, in basketball that he arranged the 1964 NBA All-Star Tour of Europe, and it ended in Cairo, Egypt, because he could not get visas into the Soviet Union and play at Red Square like they had planned, because the Soviets were worried that Red Arbeck's team was going to kick the rear ends of the Soviets. But Kennedy invited uh, the hometown for him, the hometown team. Uh, the Boston Celtics, although Kennedy grew up for the most part less than a mile from my house in Bronxville, New York, even though he's a Bostonian, allegedly. Uh, LBJ, you would never think, looking at that face, that he is responsible for the Super Bowl, but Lyndon Baines Johnson is responsible for the Super Bowl. He signed uh, a bill November 8th, 1966, that ultimately would create the Super Bowl. Now, much of the legwork for that bill came from the Brooklyn Congressman Emanuel Seller and two Louisiana politicians, Russell Long and Hale Boggs. Hale Boggs, the father of uh, Cookie Roberts, who uh, was on uh, ABC and uh, NPR. Um, Long Senator Boggs, the congressman. The 1964 Super Bowl created in part by the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, the game's roots could be traced back to a game never played. 1965 American Football League All-Star Game. African-American players boycotted that game. It set off a series of events that concluded in the first championship game between the AFL and the NFL, known as the American Football League, National Football League World Championship game, not the Super Bowl, almost two years later. Uh, despite the passage of the Civil Rights Act, African-American players ran into problems. They couldn't get uh, cabs uh, from the airport to the hotels in uh, New Orleans, the uh, Roosevelt and the Fountain Blue. Uh, they were called names. Uh, in one case, uh, Ernie Ladd was threatened with a gun by a bouncer uh, at a uh, Bourbon Street uh, pub, bar, whatever you want to call it there. Uh, and uh, the players met on mass and decided that's it. We're not going to stay here. The game has moved to uh, Houston. New Orleans was supposed to get a team. Never did because of the problems there. There was Cookie Gilchrist, who was one of the guys who uh, was uh, was in charge of uh, the, well, not in charge, who led the way for the boycott. Uh, New Orleans never got an AFL team, but it would become a political football in 1966. Uh, the two leagues, uh, Lamar Hunt's league, which started in 1959, the AFL and the old league, um, the NFL would merge after an agreement uh, was reached between Hunt and Texas E. Schramm, who was the uh, Dallas Cowboys president, jack of all trades, and gave the Cowboys the name that stuck, America's team. Whether you like it or not, 
it was Texas E. Schramm who did it. I still have my five fingers on my five on my right hand after shaking hands with him, which I consider an accomplishment. Tex liked to talk. Anyway, uh, New Orleans becomes the political football. And uh, when the merger was uh, uh, approached by Congress or was uh, what Congress was approached uh, by Pete Rozell, the commissioner of the NFL, he found there were two roadblocks, Long and Bods, two very powerful players in both chambers. And that's me in 1986, all smiles with a tie and hair. And that's Pete Rozell in 1986. That's the USFL, NFL antitrust suit, uh, Foley Square, Southern District of New York. And right across the street from there was Richard Nixon's office. Again, to Nixon in a couple of minutes. Uh, Roselle lobbied both. They didn't see how a merger would benefit New Orleans. Eventually, a deal is cut with Boggs. A 1967 NFL expansion team goes to New Orleans. Uh, there were some political maneuverings by uh, Manuel Seller that kept 15 NFL teams, nine AFL teams in their cities. Uh, the game, the Super Bowl, which wasn't called the Super Bowl at that time, played in Los Angeles, big event city, but they didn't think it was a big event, 33,000 empty seats in the Los Angeles Coliseum. Oh, there he is. My, my old acquaintance, uh, Richard Nixon. Uh, I first met Richard in 1985. Um, Richard Nixon comes back into public life in a big way, not because of the David Frost interviews. Comes back because Richie Phillips was the head of the uh, Major League Baseball Umpires Association. And uh, this is after 1984. And the uh, Major League owners and the umpires in an impasse. Uh, the umpires won a new contract. And uh, Richie Phillips uh, lives down in Philadelphia Society Hill, or lives in Philadelphia Society Hill. And uh, he's telling me the story about Nixon one day. And he says, uh, yeah, I, I called up Peter Uberoth. I said, um, how about arbitration? We're getting nowhere. And, and Peter said, well, who do you got in mind? He says, well, Dick Nixon. He said, Dick Nixon, get out of here. He said, how do you know Dick Nixon? Well, Richie Phillips, next door neighbor, Society Hill down off the main line in Philadelphia, they're his next door neighbor. They were Julian David Eisenhower. And every weekend, uh, Dick would drive down from Park Ridge, New Jersey, down the, the, the Garden State Parkway to exit 11 and, and then go on the New Jersey Turnpike and get off at exit four. And he was there and he'd be there babysitting every weekend. So he got to know Richie Phillips. And um, he got to arbitrate the uh, umpires dispute, gave the umpires everything they wanted. Uh, opening the door to China, I do a very long talk on this. This is the, the thumbnail, very short version of this, uh, which only lasts about three minutes because I'm doing everything else. Um, Nixon will go to China in 1972 after the United States table tennis team in 1971, travel to, and this, I got to say to my old ninth grade social studies teacher, Stewie Gates, who is still alive uh, in his 90s in Stony Point, New York, because he stressed upon us, red China and communist China in ninth grade social studies. So anyway, so uh, the United States table tennis team would travel to red or communist China. It after, was in Japan. After, after, well, we're getting to that. After, after uh, they played in Japan. Ping pong diplomacy produces a thaw in the United States red China uh, relationship. During the 1971 World Table Tennis Championships in Nagoya, Japan, a 19-year-old player by the name of Glenn Cowan, who my wife knew from the New Rochelle, New York beach clubs, and she said he had the, the best paddle ball or, or, or ping pong racket she ever saw, custom made. His father bought it for him when he was there, when she was a little kid and he was there. Anyway, uh, hopped on the shuttle bus carrying the, the uh, Chinese national team, and Chuan Zhang uh, stepped forward to shake Cowan's hand, speak through an interpreter. For some reason, he had a gift. Now, this is probably a plant. We may never know it, but he had a gift for Cowan. Like, this was all planned out. So he gives him uh, a gift, a picture, and Cowan, the next day, uh, gives him uh, a t-shirt with the Beatles lyric, Let It Be, on there. Mel would then shock the world and all expense pay trip to China, which is better than the prices right was giving out at that time. Uh, after checking with their embassy, the American players accepted. 
Uh, I was as surprised as I was pleased. Nixon later wrote in his memoirs, uh, I never expected that the Chinese initiative would come to fruition in the form of a ping pong team. Uh, on April 14th, 1971, the same day that the American players met with Cho and Lai, uh, Nixon announced that the United States was easing its travel bans and trade embargoes against China. The Americans and Chinese uh, soon opened new back channel communications with one another. Uh, a little context here, by 1968, Mao Zedong was totally disenchanted with the Soviet Union. Nixon campaigned in 1968 with the hopes of opening up China. So this is three years of a dance that taking, have taken part by this point. Title IX was passed in 1972. That's Edith Grange. She was a uh, Oregon Congresswoman. Uh, and she uh, first got to Congress in 1955. It would be Nixon that signs the Title IX legislation designed to give women an equal opportunity to get an education in American colleges and universities with men. And there's a problem with this because they also specifically specified sports, which Donna Deverona, who's a friend of mine, she won two gold medals in the uh, 1964 Tokyo Olympics in swimming, told me was the biggest mistake ever put in Title IX. She should have just said all educational opportunities because sports would become an albatross around the neck of Title IX. And to this day, and we're now talking 49 years later, Donna says it was a major mistake. Uh, no person in the United States shall on the basis of sex be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or subjected to discrimination under education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. The battle of Title IX legislation and women's sports still being fought. Some coaches and athletic directors continue to cry foul saying that they have to cut men's sports programs and keep women's programs to stay in compliance with Title IX rules. Uh, incidentally enough, uh, or coincidentally, Nixon signs this thing into law June 23rd, 1972, uh, and doesn't talk about it, just signs it. There's a news conference, he signs it, and he talks about a myriad of other things, but not how he changed the lives of hundreds of millions of American women from that day on never said a word about it. Nixon was also upset at Avery Brundage uh, and the International Olympic Committee. Uh, Brundage had said uh, in an interview prior to the Munich Olympics in 1972 that the finest games that ever took place in the Olympics was in 1936 in Berlin, the Hitler games. And uh, Brundage's company, a construction company, did work with Brin uh, Brundage to build some before the United States broke off uh, relationships with uh, Germany, did build some office buildings on behalf of the German government in 1937 in Washington. Munich 11, the nine uh, Israeli athletes and the two Israeli coaches who were killed uh, during the botch rescued uh, after the uh, hostage kidnap situation by the uh, Black September group, an offshoot of the Palestinian Liberation Organization. The massacre, that was the first time that Americans actually were sitting in their living rooms watching uh, a terrorist attack unfold before their eyes. Um, Germany botched the rescue attempt. Uh, the athletes were killed along with uh, several of the Palestinians, along with uh, some um, uh, Munich policemen and others. And Nixon is infuriated, absolutely infuriated about what's going on. And he sends a letter to Avery Brundage demanding that the rest of the games be called off. And Avery Brundage, being whoever Avery Brundage was, wasn't going to listen to Richard Nixon. Why would I do that? Continued the game. The games must go on. The games must go on. And so they did. Nixon also wanted to watch some TV in 1972. He wanted to watch his friend George Allen's football team from Washington play Green Bay in a, pre in a uh, postseason playoff game on Christmas Eve, 1972. You know, hey, listen, Nixon maybe the most powerful man in the world, but you know what? His friend, George Allen, he's running the team. He's even called a play for George Allen or sent in a play for George Allen. Uh, and uh, yeah, Nixon wants to be like everybody else. He wants to sit in his t-shirt and underwear with a beer in front of him, lean back and just watch his favorite football team, the Washington football team. But uh, he has a problem. 
And even the most powerful man in the United States, maybe the world, can't beat the NFL. Can't beat the NFL. Uh, in 1950, the National Football League Commissioner Brooke Bell told his owners, blackout home games. Want to, people to buy tickets to go see the games, particularly in Los Angeles. We don't want them in front of the TVs. We want them in the stadium, buying tickets, buying concessions, and buying merchandise. We can make money that way. In 1951, um, the owner said, hey, or 1950, the owner said, uh, hey, you know what? You're probably right. Um, the Los Angeles Rams uh, in 1949 put their games, local games on TV because they signed a deal with the Admiral TV Company in Southern California because Admiral wanted to sell TVs. And they saw their attendance drop by 50%. Uh, in 1950, that uh, rule has come back, like at your home games. And now, hey, your local Admiral dealer, and there was no such thing as a local Admiral dealer as an appliance store back in those days, presents Dick Huffman, tackle with the Los Angeles Rams. Uh, and that would be your 1950 card from your Admiral dealer. By 1951, the NFL is in the courtroom blacking its black or backing its uh, blackout policy. In 53, the judge in Philadelphia, Alan K. Grimm, who would come back in 1961 and tell Roselle that black, you know, you want to do that, that uh, bundle your teams together. That's not going to hold up. I can't rule in favor of it. Go to Congress and have them deal with it. You got Emmanuel Seller to do that. Uh, Grimm said, hey, the blackout policy, it's okay. It's not in violation of antitrust laws. In 1957, Detroit sold out uh, its championship game against uh, San Francisco, the NFL championship game, but it was blacked out because of the policy and the game was not seen in Detroit. So Nixon has nothing to do. It's this, um, you know, he, he's sitting around and he's beginning to bristle over the thought that he can't sit in his underwear with a beer in front of him with his feet up on uh, the ottoman uh, or from the ottoman on the table and watch his friend to, uh, you're right in the picture, George Allen. And my favorite guy in the, one of my favorite people in the NFL, the guy there at the end wearing the hat and the, uh, the, the Washington uh, jacket, Mark Levy, the only coach who ever got in the NFL history who ever received uh, a Harvard graduate degree in English literature. My man, Mark. Mark was a really good guy. Anyway, uh, so Nixon has nothing to do. So let's do this like we're at Dragnet. On December 18th, 1972, at 2.06 in the afternoon, Nixon met with Attorney General Richard Kleinendies at the Executive Office Building. The reason? I want to watch George Allen's Washington NFL playoff game, and I can't. Nixon decides he's going to intervene. He wants to watch the Green Bay-Washington game. It is Christmas Eve. It's going to be blacked out in Washington. Game is sold out. He doesn't feel like he wants to go up to Camp David. You know, why would he want to go to Camp David and all that when he could sit in a little enclave off the Oval Office by himself enjoying the football game? Uh, eventually, a compromise would be reached between the NFL and the government that uh, if any game was not, was not sold out within 72 hours of the kickoff, it could be blacked out locally. Nixon would sign the blackout law before the 1973 season. The league adopted the 72-hour rule after the law expired in 1975, and that uh, some piece of that law is still good today, although it's been changed to uh, club seats and luxury boxes and, you know, and you can sell some tickets, but as long as the premium seats are sold out, it's not a problem. Gerald Ford, college football player, played back in Michigan back in the 1930s. Um, he gives the NCAA a break because the NCAA believes in something called principle and amateurism and looks after athletes by keeping them away from the temptation of professionalism and commercialism and looks after the best interests of student athletes. The group got a special tax exempt status as a charitable organization under the IRS code as well as Congress and Ford in 1976. Colleges whose football teams appear at bowl games, like the University of Illinois or Northwestern, don't have to pay taxes on their take from the bowl games or from TV. Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter 
Um, Jimmy Carter's problems with sports start in 1979 when the Soviet Union on Christmas Eve invades Afghanistan. In 1980, Jimmy Carter gives an ultimatum to the Soviet Union. Pull your troops out of Afghanistan by February 20th or the United States would boycott the Summer Olympics in Moscow. On March 21st, the United States pulled out of the Moscow Games. It was joined by 60 other countries in the boycott. USA, USA, USA. That was first heard in Lake Placid, New York during the game between the Soviets and the Americans. That was a Friday afternoon game. And the only live TV of that game was in Canada or maybe in Detroit from Windsor or Buffalo, uh, the border cities might have seen that game. But in the United States, nobody saw the game. Nobody saw Al Michaels saying, do you believe in miracles? Nobody saw that game. It was on tape delay, but the United States would beat the Soviets and uh, they did not win the gold medal. Uh, they still had to beat Finland on Sunday. And if they lost to Finland and the Soviets won the next game and scored X amount of goals against the Czechs, they could have still won the gold medal because of the uh, Olympic rules. Carter uh, called the uh, Herbie Brooks and uh, Herb Brooks, I, I knew Herbie, Herb Brooks and the team afterwards and said, great job guys beating the Soviets. Uh, Carter would issue a trade embargo on uh, the Soviets after they didn't listen to him. Um, the Soviets couldn't get grain and information and they couldn't get informational technology. I'll leave it at that. Uh, he also restricted Soviet uh, fishing in American controlled ocean waters. The Soviets would pull out of Afghanistan in 1989. The boycott failed. Ronald Reagan gave two gifts to American sports owners the 1984 Cable TV Act and uh, the tax code reformation in 1986. In 1984, Reagan signed into law the Cable TV Act of 1984. What it did was socialize cable TV for those who wanted almost everything offered on the basic expanded tier back in 1984. It was the old Frank Sinatra song, All or Nothing at All. Oh, you can take basic, but that basic was just local channels. You just got better reception. Uh, if you took basic expanded, well, you would get ESPN, you would get CNN, you would get the Weather Channel, which were, the, were three of the biggest things in those days. Also WGN in Chicago, WSBK uh, in Boston, Channel 38, WPIX in WOR in New York, super stations. Um, basically, this act saved ESPN, CNN, and the Weather Channel from going out of business because all the uh, stations were bundled together and you had to buy all or you bought nothing. Uh, sports owners realized, hey, if we could start our own regional network um, on TV. MTV too. Yeah, yeah MTV too. Uh, if you wanted to, the sports owners like Eddie Einhorn would start their own regional networks or somebody else would start a regional network. And eventually they would get huge amount of money out of this. George Steinbrenner would sign a $550 million TV deal, $53 million, $54 million a year with the MSG network in New York by 1988. Uh, the impact, uh, all or nothing at all, legislation saved ESPN, CNN, others from financial ruin, and sports operators began getting major money from cable TV. Uh, I'm just putting this picture up from Cincinnati. You can even say this from Chicago with uh, the new Comiskey Park in Chicago. Uh, you may not have noticed, but virtually every city, major league city, has built or renovated an old stadium, thanks to what happened in 1986. Reagan left an enormous impact on sports, putting his signature on the Tax Reform Act of 1986. It opened a loophole in the tax laws and gave owners ammunition in their battles with cities and states uh, to get stadiums. I'm going to simplify this as best I can. Um, I've given talks to colleges on this, and the college kids get all confused, but I'm gonna, I, I've simplified it down to this. The law gave municipalities a federal tax exemption on bonds to build new stadiums. After the 1986 tax code revision was passed, under the right set of circumstances, a sports owner 
and his very sharp law team figured out that an owner could keep up to 92 cents out of every dollar generated in a publicly funded stadium or an arena. Cincinnati, they built two stadiums, one for the Reds, one for the NFL Bengals. And uh, the eight cents that they got out of every, every dollar generated from ticket sales, from signage, from concessions, from parking lots, certainly wasn't enough to pay down the debt. So Cincinnati had to lay off workers, had to cut services, had to raise property taxes, had to raise sales taxes to pay down the debt because that eight cents is never gonna, never gonna cover that. So basically you could go from city to city, Nashville raised a sewer tax and a water tax, and you can go from city to city to see what taxes were raised uh, basically to give, to pay down the debt to make sure the teams were kept or teams were attracted to cities. Uh, coincidentally, the uh, baseball MLB expanded by four. The National Hockey League has expanded now by 11 teams. Uh, the NBA, you could throw out Toronto and Vancouver, but they are up to 30. So they expanded by seven teams, something like that. Um, six teams, seven teams, and uh, the NFL expanded to 32, and uh, Major League Soccer um, came about in 1995, and they were able to build stadiums because of this, and the taxpayers picked up the bill. Uh, I spoke at the George Bush Presidential Library in 2007, August of 2007, and it was a talk called The Politics of Sports Business, and it was given to uh, three Russians, three Indonesians, three uh, Nigerians, three Venezuelans, three Russians, four Americans, and one Canadian. And basically, uh, that's your, tax day or your taxpayer dollars at work. That's me, your taxpayer's dollars at work. And um, it was all about the politics of sports business, how it operates in the United States. And they sought me because I had been on TV, Sam Donaldson's show, doing this and uh, they said, hey, why don't you come down here and give that talk? Because we've seen you on Sam's show and we thought you were terrific. So it's Sam, as a matter of fact. Me, eh. But anyway, um, so I'm down there and I'm talking about the politics of sports business. And uh, George H.W. Bush was heavily involved in the politics of sports business because uh, in 1990, he signed the Anabolic Steroids Control Act into law, and that made uh, the legislation made the possession of steroids without a physician's approval illegal. Uh, not that Major League Baseball, the other sports, cared much about it because you hear about the so-called steroids era. But you know, here's my deal with Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens and all that. If what they were doing, and they can't get in the Hall of Fame, if what they were doing was so bad, why weren't they ever arrested? That is a, a, a conversation that you never hear in baseball. They were supposed to be arrested. It's illegal unless some doctor says you can have it. And all of those who uh, were picked up uh, because of steroids never, never, ever said they took steroids, at least in the court. They were picked up for uh, uh, mail fraud or, or things of that nature. Uh, Bonds and, and, and Clemens were never picked up. If it was so bad, why weren't they arrested? Another question for another day. Bill Clinton. Hey, you know, in 1994, I covered the uh, baseball strike between the owners and the players, uh, which started in August of uh, 1994. And if somebody from the White House would have picked up the phone and said, hey, Evan, uh, what do you think? You think Bill Clinton could solve the baseball thing? I would have laughed. I said, what are you kidding me? Uh, I just hope they serve them good food down there because yeah, Bill Clinton, he's never going to get this done because they don't want to get it done. They want to get it done on their own and they want to get it done on their own terms. But Clinton calls him down to the Oval Office and um, that was a mistake. Uh, he tries to hammer out the settlement and failed miserably. It would be uh, Soda Soda Mayer, who is now on the uh, Supreme Court, uh, who would rule play ball after the Players Association got the national uh Labor Relations Board uh, recommendation that the owners uh, bargain in bad faith. And it's funny, my wife went to a hairdresser down on Lafayette Street uh, in Lower Manhattan and sitting next to her is Sona Sotomayor. And for about an hour while my wife is getting work done, we talked about, and she said, you know, it's the easiest thing in the world. They presented this evidence, play ball. She said, 
you could have done it looking at me. And I said, gee, thanks. <laughs> and then she became a Supreme Court justice, so much so to my ear. Actually, she was on the Supreme Court when she was getting her hair done at Jeffrey Cheng uh, down on Lafayette Street. Uh, uh, Kurt Flood Act of 1998 signed into law by uh, Bill Clinton gave baseball players the same rights under American antitrust laws that basketball, football, hockey, and soccer players enjoy. George W. Bush, well, in the 2004 State of the Union address, he addressed his uh, father's concern about steroids and his father's law, which was passed into, uh, which the legislation was done in 1990 and signed into law in 1990, taking effect in 1991. Uh, so he included a segment in the State of the Union address about steroids and athletes using steroids in sports. By 2005, the bully pulpit worked Congress held hearings on the use of steroids in sports. Um, one thing that you may not know about the Olympics, which I'm going to tell you, because you might know also, uh, the United States provides an awful lot of the security for most Olympics. Maybe not in Beijing, maybe not in Moscow, but in other places. And the Bush administration, as part of the war on terrorism, provided most of the security for the Athens Olympics in 2004, uh, including Patriot missiles surrounding uh, the Athens area, all part of a war on terrorism. Barack Obama. Now, if somebody from the White House in 2009 called me and said, you know, Barack is thinking about genuflecting in front of the International Olympic Committee, because that's what the IOC wants leaders to do, like Tony Blair in 2005 to get the London Olympics and Putin in 2007 to get the Sochi Olympics. They want leaders to genuflect. And somebody said, well, the cops said, should Barack go to uh, Copenhagen and try to get uh, the Americans um, or the IOC to give the Americans the 2016 Olympics in Chicago? My answer was, no, don't do it. They love the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Their economies are hot. They've never done uh, an Olympics in South America. Lula, the uh, head of Brazil, is an international superstar as president of Brazil. It's a futile effort. It's an absolute futile effort. I don't know why you would want to do it. Because I was, let's, let's say, I, I knew a lot about the 2005 New York bid for the uh, Olympics for 2012 thanks to Jay Kriegel and others, and I knew how the IOC operated. Well, I knew how the IOC operated with one Antonio Samarich in the 1980s. Anyway, so I'll, I'll let Barack talk about why Chicago didn't get the Olympics. I remember this vividly when Chicago had the bid for the 2016 Olympics. A very effective committee had flown to Copenhagen to make their presentation, and Michelle had gone with them. I got a call, I think, before the thing ended, but on fairly short notice that everybody thought if I flew out there, we'd have a good chance of getting it, and it might be worth essentially just taking a one-day trip. So we fly out there. Subsequently, I think we've learned that IOC decisions are similar to FIFA, the governing body of, of, of international football or soccer, similar to FIFA's decisions, a little bit cooked. Uh, no, uh, uh, Barack, it is overdone, not a little bit cooked, it's overdone. Anyway, we didn't even make the first cut despite the fact by all objective metrics, the American bid was the best. Now, 109 years after Teddy Roosevelt held what essentially was a, con a concussion summit on football, Barack Obama holds one. And Obama did not know about Teddy Roosevelt's initiative in 1905. And this included football, and this included girls' soccer and cheerleading, and hockey and other sports. And Obama is asked whether or not he would, if he had boys, would he allow them to play football based on all the evidence that football, using your head as much as you do, uh, and getting banged around, and, and, the, and your brain is, is basically you know, in a fluid. And every time you're hit, your brain bangs up against your skull, and it could do damage. And Obama said, uh, I wouldn't allow my sons to play football. Uh, it was the first summit on concussions and the last summit on concussions. Uh, it has not been uh, taken up since then. Uh, there was the movie Concussion by Will Smith, which got buried. Uh, and now you don't hear anything about the concussion issue. It hasn't gone away in football. It hasn't gone away in hockey. 
but you just don't hear about it. Nobody talks about the concussion issue. Uh, the NFL and college football has done a great job in burying it, and nobody, it's not anybody's conscience anymore, especially after the Will Smith movie, Concussion, was buried. Uh, so they have the summit and nothing happened. Donald Trump, in his four years as president, tackled some sports issues. He pledged support for the 2028 Los Angeles Olympics bid. Uh, Los Angeles got that. Pledged support for the 2026 World Cup bid by the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Uh, those three countries got it. It's a joint bid. Uh, and by the end of this year, um, FIFA hopes to announce which American, Canadian, and Mexican cities are getting games. He pardoned Jack Johnson. Jack Johnson was arrested back in 1913. He was the heavyweight champion of the world. Uh, and he violated this thing called the Mann Act. The Mann Act was put into law because of uh, sex trafficking. And, um, and part of it was you couldn't take a woman over state lines for moral purposes. And they nailed Jack Johnson because he took a white woman, his wife, over state line for violating the Mann Act. He spent some time in jail, went to Europe and became really successful. He was a successful businessman. John McCain started pushing for the pardon of Jack Johnson, but it wasn't until Sylvester Stallone called Donald Trump and said, why don't you pardon Jack Johnson? And he also criticized NFL players and NBA players for protesting uh, uh, during the national anthem prior to games by taking a knee. Uh, White House visits were contentious and uh, to the point where teams just did not show up uh, to the White House. And a guy like Kevin Durant didn't show up to the White House. And uh, finally, Joe Biden. Uh, Joe Biden has only been in office, let's say, January 30th, 10 days, and he's already got his first sports issue in front of him. Uh, 21, 2021 Tokyo Olympics. Should we send athletes or not send athletes because of COVID-19? And uh, a Japanese International Olympic Committee delegate on Friday uh, said, Joe, give us a signal. If you send the athletes, if you say it's okay, that's going to help us an awful lot in making sure the Tokyo Olympics take place if the Americans take the lead. A um, couple of things that uh, you might see come across uh, Biden's desk, uh, the 2022 Olympics in China and human rights violations, particularly the Uyghurs. Um, which is a, a, in China, which is a minority, and a harsh treatment of the uh, Uyghurs. That might be an issue that um, may come across Biden's desk. And the others, should college football players be paid? Uh, the uh, NCAA is trying to get Congress to do something. I don't know what they're trying to get them to do, but to do something maybe to regulate uh, college football and payments to players, because as of right now, if somebody wants to go to Florida, it's an unlimited paycheck if they get, say, I don't know, Winn-Dixie uh, to sponsor them, come to our supermarket, and you don't have that going on. Now, I don't know if you have it in Illinois yet where players could be paid. In uh, California, they could be paid for their likenesses. So Biden may be called upon find out his opinion on whether college players should be paid or not. So uh, in a nutshell, presidents matter in sports and their sports decisions actually impact society. Thank you so much. Thank you, Meg. And thank you, everyone.